Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our course uh, created by Astra T in collaboration with Idea Statica on design of discontinuity regions for steel and concrete structures. Uh, there will be an opportunity for questions towards the end, and also you will be receiving your CPD certificate after. So now, without further ado, I will hand it over to Costis, who will be chairing on today, and uh, um, sorry, Theo will be chairing today, and Costi will be presenting. Yes this course yes thank you Giovanni um, I hope you can hear me yeah yeah yes perfect, perfect. okay good so yeah welcome to our uh, second course in cooperation with the ice track T um, it is actually the last one before the summer break we will of course continue later on with uh, other webinars and, and courses uh, starting from September um, my name is uh, Theodor Tsiozidis, uh, or Theo. Um, I'm the Managing Director of Idea Statica UK, and I have with me Kostis Hadzopoulos, who is our Technical Manager, who is going to do the uh, presentation today. So, uh, for those of you who haven't uh, used uh, GoToWebinar in the past, uh, you have a, a right on your right side, uh, you have a control panel where you can basically ask any questions you have uh, during the webinar. Um, we will, of course, have a little bit of time at the end, but feel free to send us anything you want during the webinar, and we will make sure that we we'll answer them through the chat. Uh, in case, of course, something uh, is not answered today, we will answer via email. Um, uh, this uh, series of uh, webinars and courses with, uh, that we have organized with the ISTRAC T, they're all aiming to educate engineers uh, about new technologies and uh, processes for the design of structural details and members. Um, as you can see, today we are uh, delivering the course that has to do with the design of discontinuity regions. Uh, as I said earlier, we'll uh, pick it up again on September with uh, fatigue checks for steel connections. Um, these uh, last four events are not on the website yet of ISTRAC T, but in the coming days we will upload all the material and the registration link, so you will be able to register for those events as well. Um, going through the agenda today. So the first part is uh, focusing on discontinuity regions in concrete. Um, then if we have a little bit of time before we finish this, this section, we will have a QA. and uh, At one o'clock, we're going to do a 30 minutes break. Um, and then we'll continue at 1.30 uh, with uh, discontinuity regions in steel structures. And at the end, we have, hopefully we will have a little bit of time. Uh, for Q&A. Uh, the session will remain open during the break, so you, you uh, can just leave it open and come back on uh, at 1.30. So uh, this theme, uh, today's theme is design of discontinued regions. Uh, this is actually something that we have touched a little bit in the previous webinars and courses, uh, especially when it comes to steel connections and, and steel castellated beams. Uh, but today we are going to look into uh, concrete structures as well and also dig a little bit deeper into the steel uh, by focusing specifically on discontinuity regions. Um, before we start, before I give the presenter to Kostis, I wanted to make a quick poll uh, just to understand um, a little bit of uh, a little bit how you have actually, if you have actually designed the regions in the past and in which type of structures you have designed the regions. So I'm going to run uh, quickly the poll. So I Hope you can see it by now. So uh, please uh, tell us if you have designed, obviously, uh, D regions in the past, uh, in which type of uh, structures? Is it uh, in situ concrete buildings? Is it precast buildings? 
is it bridges uh, is it steel buildings or is it various structures during uh, modifications and uh, erection uh, obviously if you haven't designed dirigibles in the past you can just uh, skip the poll but if you have please let us know in which type of uh, structures you have actually done this and you can choose uh, multiple uh, items as well so i can see that votes are already coming in I'm just going to leave it a few more seconds. Okay, um, I can see that already 60%, more than 60% of the attendants have voted, so 64. Thank you. Okay, I think we've reached 70%, so that's that's a really good result. So I'm just going to close it because we don't have much time. I'm going to close the poll. And let me quickly share the results. So we see that half of you have used, uh, have designed the regions in, in typical in-situ concrete buildings. And a lot of you in precast and steel. Um, I, I can see that the results are uh, pretty much, let's say, uh, divided into the different options, but definitely the most uh, common one is the in-situ concrete building. So thank you very much for that. Uh, I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint and I think with this, I can uh, pass on the presenter to Kostis, who can start the uh, presentation. So I'm going to give you the presenter. And thank you, Theodore. The floor is yours. I think that we can also deactivate our cameras for now. So yes. That we can set some bandwidth. Uh, just verify that you can see my screen. Yes, perfect. Okay, good. So I would also like to welcome everyone from my side and move to the main topic of this course, which is discontinuity regions. So before we move on to the next slide, uh, I think that everyone today is familiar with global analysis tools uh, with linear or even non-linear analysis capabilities where we calculate structures and several load cases for many different design situations these tools the results of these calculations are combined to produce envelope load case combinations which are then passed to post processing modules in order to design or verify each part of the structure according to the code provisions. However, all of these calculations rely on a basic assumption. This basic assumption is that all static and geometric quantities only very gradually and as such what we call the Bernoulli's hypothesis applies. This means that plane sections remain plane after deformation. You probably remember this from uh, your university days. Uh, we also have to understand that many of the rules provided to the corresponding code sections also rely on the same assumption. However, the issue is that this condition is not satisfied on every region of our structures. And it is that we need to classify its structure location mm -hmm. in what we call B regions, where this hypothesis applies, or D regions, where this hypothesis is simply not valid. 
usually the most critical parts of the structure, or at least like a big percentage of these parts, are typically regions where abrupt changes in geometry occur, where we have large concentrated loads. And the thing is that these regions exist in both concrete and steel structures, and for both materials, the applicable codes have dedicated sections for their design and check. Uh, in these sections, in the special sections of the code, there are some special provisions with special checks and detailing rules for each discontinuity type in case this is supported. Uh, now, uh, Dealing with discontinuity regions is the main topic of today's course, and I will begin with concrete structures and the importance of these regions for their design. The second part of this course, after the break, we will also discuss some of their steel counterparts. Uh, so, Moving to the regions of concrete, let's first see some examples of such regions. So in this picture here, I have uh, created a frame where we, where we can identify from top to bottom the region where the concentrated low ducts. Then there are frame corners where there is a sudden change of, of the geometry. Then we can identify the cobalt that is supporting the duct end of a precast beam. Both the cobalt and the duct end are the regions. We also have the locations around the beam openings that are the regions. And lastly, we have the foundation parts where again we have a change of geometry. In into the great areas that denote these regions, uh, we can identify that most of the critical parts and about half of the structure is, uh, is, is, uh, has these properties. Besides these components that I, that I have quickly shown, uh, there are also precast walls with openings. We have bridge diaphragms, we have pile caps that are all perfect examples of the D regions. The theoretical difference between D regions and B regions that was explained is the validity of the Bernoulli hypothesis. I will not go into much more detail on this topic and we'll discuss it only superficially to lay the ground for the next sections. So specifically for concrete design, the Bernoulli hypothesis leads to the adoption of the linear strain hypothesis that we can see in this diagram. Then on the basis of the linear strain distribution, our global analysis software calculates the internal force components that are then used for the design from our post-processing module. And we have also to keep in mind that these internal forces are mostly derived from uh, software that employs beam elements with fully elastic materials that can only provide a satisfactory approximation of the actual stress state if the initial Bernoulli hypothesis is valid. Then we also have the post-processing module that designs concrete sections that is also based on an internal force redistribution derived from a material stress-strain law. Again, based on the assumption of linear strain uh, distributions, uh, we're creating these stress distributions and then we derive the forces to calculate the required, the required reinforcement, etc. Fortunately, 
since in D regions the linear strain hypothesis is invalid, then both the internal force redistribution and the chosen uh, from the chosen material stress uh, strain law and calculated forces are both questionable. To understand the impact of this fact, let's move to the next slide. For example, taken from the book, Finite Element Design, Concrete Structures, which on a separate note is one of my favorite on this topic, and it is a highly recommended read for everyone interested in design of structures. In this book, Professor Robach is testing several models, both beam-based and self-element-based. And since we know that beam-based models are widely used in everyday practice, uh, it makes sense to compare the behavior uh, with the self-element cell models. I like the issue of the Bernoulli assumption. Professor compares the transverse behavior of a hollow section cross section from one of the longest segmental bridges in the world, the one displayed in this slide, uh, that is analyzed with both cell element models and beam element models. Besides other conclusions, a very important one in this case is that the web deck slab junction uh, this in this region a very complicated stress strain distribution is displayed that certainly cannot be modeled with beam elements let's get a closer look in this complex stress distribution uh, so we can see through this rotating principal stress, stress tra trajectories that uh, the Bernoulli assumption is not valid. And we can also see that the rotation stops at distance. This distance is about one member high. After this distance, the stresses at the section along the member height begin to linearize, as we can see in these two sections here. And then the disturbance fades away. Uh, this is not the case with the horizontal section at the bottom, where we can see that the stress distribution is not linearized yet, yet since this is too close to the disturbance. So basically, after this distance, after one member height, the Bernoulli assumption is valid once again. However, this, uh, this region has an impact to the structure. At this point, some may argue that the discontinuity is so small that can be neglected and that we could even get good results in terms of moment and shear at a distance of one height. This may be true to some extent, but there is also another parameter that influences the design. And this is the stiffness, which is very, very different uh, as displayed from the beam and cell element models that, uh, that are both compared in this book. They have different results, especially in the displacement in the mid-span of the structure. Another issue that is identified uh, from the author for this region is that besides the structural analysis, one important thing is good detailing of the reinforcement that is very important with respect to both the load bearing capacity and the serviceability of the structures. As we will see in the next slide, this is something very important and we need to pay attention to the detailing rules in this region. This is a lesson 
that the engineering community learned the hard way from a famous accident, which was the collapse of the slide pl platform that is presented in this slide. Uh, I will shortly describe the structure and what happened. So what we see here is a cone dip like platform that consists of these 24 cells that we see in the plan view. Uh, these cells, moving to the elevation view, we can see that these cells are closed at the top, at the bottom. Uh, and we have four shafts that extend above the level of the sea at the height of 110 meters. And these shafts support a steel deck of a total weight of 40,000 tons. Uh, the issue is that this platform collapsed, but please note at this point, and it is a very important point, that this was the 12th built in a series of gravity-based structures. So it was not a unique case. They have, they have, uh, the engineers that designed this one uh, designed 11 identical structures that did not collapse. However, in this case, when it was undergoing a controlled ballast test in order to check for leakage, the structure collapsed in just 18 minutes and the total financial financial loss was 250 million dollars now the thing is that this collapse was after detailed experimental and numerical investigations uh, it was discovered that the collapse was initiated by failure of a wall in this structure, which is called a tricycle. The problem was mainly the underestimation of the internal tensile forces. Uh, the underestimation was about 50% due to an error in the finite element analysis, leading to insufficient reinforcement and bad detailing of this part. Was the reinforcement configuration is displayed in this picture, where a T-headed bar is displaced in the intersection between the cell walls. However, this bar was not properly anchored uh, into the compressed region of the wall, leading to a growing crack and then subsequently uh, to the collapse of the structure. According to the professor, Professor Rombach, the lessons learned from this accident is, firstly, that these critical regions of the structure should be analyzed separately from the whole structure. Means of, for example, stratum time models or a refined finite element model uh, that util using the substructure method. Uh, by substructure, we mean that we can isolate a part of the structure, analyze it, and then apply the resultant forces back uh, to the outer surface of the superstructure, etc. However, it must be also noted that this is not a trivial task. Similarities of concrete as a material. This is the reason that the professor warns us that we need to have detailed knowledge of both finite and, uh, uh, analysis and the material behavior. So now that we understand the importance of the structures, let's begin to scratch this, uh, uh, the surface of the current methodologies and have a look to the code provisions in the current version of the European. So in section 9.9, .9, the 
Bureau could require that the regions should normally be designed with the stratum type model and according to another section. And they should also be detailed according to uh, the rules given in section eight, which means that we should uh, take care of the detailing limitations defined in the code, such as reinforcement bar distances, minimum and maximum reinforcement areas, and of course, proper anchoring. There is also an XJ where some strat and tie advice is offered for some of the configurations uh, for the details in deep beams, frame corners, corbels, and for uh, but of course there are some other configurations that are not covered and the engineer must seek advice in the relevant literature. Additionally, in section 10, there are some rules for precast elements and provisions regarding connection configurations and some indicative models for half joints. Button time models are very popular tools for the design of uh, these regions in, in engineering pra practice. And this is the reason that they are employed in almost every one of the modern codes. The reason is that these models yield direct insight into the load carrying behavior of the member and allow the dimension of reinforcement according to practical considerations. Strat and tie models share a mechanical basis through the plasticity theory and they are consistent with the lower bound, bound theorem, which means that every load that is possible, uh, for which it is possible to specify a stress state that satisfies both equilibrium and static boundary conditions without infringing the yield condition uh, is below the ultimate load. For these reasons, stratum time models typically result in conservative designs, provided that sufficient deformation capacity is available. For the sake of completeness, we should also state that while stratum time models that are commonly used for the design of these regions uh, they can also be essentially applied for the dimensioning and detailing of any concrete region and even entire structures. Now, although this method appears to be simple, there are many issues that are related to its application. The reason is that while there are many predefined stratum type configurations that are widely accepted, this is not the case for all of them. There are cases where one or most more suitable stratum type models are applicable. And in these cases, the engineer needs to identify them and apply the optimal model. The issue is that due to the nature of concrete, this is easier said than done because the arrangement, the chosen arrangement, of reinforcement will relate to an internal stress uh, redistribution that will also rearrange the crack patterns. To say it simply, the chosen strut and die model will influence the structure behavior and subsequently its mode of failure. In this image here, uh, I'm displaying four models from four different engineering schools in Europe for the same uh, structure, where each school claims that its model is correct. And while the models are seemingly similar, they all lead to different crack and failure patterns, as you can see in the second column. Now, this ambiguity is inherent 
to the stratum time method. And this is the reason that even in its software implementations require a lot of work and several design iterations for a single design. An example of this uh, ambiguity is the calculation of the strut resistance that is based on the on the effective compressive strength, uh, which is based on a reduction factor, Kc, that is displayed in this table. This factor takes uh, many effects, uh, is, uh, is considering many effects like softening of the cracked concrete, uh, the long-term loading effects, etc. In this table that I have taken from this book, compatible stress field design of structural concrete that we will discuss later. Uh, the code, uh, this factor is summarized for many codes, the Euro code, the model code, and the Swiss code. And the issue is that the application of these values becomes challenging even for experienced designers because some regions do not clearly fit into the classifications presented in this short table. Another disadvantage of the stratum time methodology is that it cannot assess the behavior of the member or region under investigation in the serviceability limit state. The reason is that these models consider a rigid, ideally plastic behavior of the material without any kinematic consideration. Even when assigning approximate stiffnesses to the struts and ties, the serviceability criteria cannot be reliably verified. Of course, the verification of ductility requirements can only be carried out based on empirical rules. At this point, it should be noted that in the Eurocode, it is mentioned that when using stratum type models with the struts oriented according to compressive stress stress trajectories in the uncracked state, it is possible to use forces in the ties to obtain the corresponding steel stresses. And then in another paragraph, the designer is left with the impression that the code can be used for verifications in the serviceability limit state as long as approximate compatibility of stratum tie models is ensured which is also a little bit ambiguous. However, in the relevant literature, it is clearly noted that it can be dangerous to use strat and time models for the assessment of serviceability state of structure, because the underlying assumption of these models is uh, that the structure is fully cracked. Of course, uh, in this case, it is stated that we could just limit the permissible stresses in the reinforcement and hope that the subsequent crack width is enough uh, according to the book presented in the slide. Now, as the proposed strat and time methodology has its limitations, the code is open, the use of alternative, more rigorous approaches, and this is probably due to the fact that a lot of effort was spent during the last decade for the development of numerical analysis software that is fit for assessing the complex concrete behavior. However, these software codes, they usually employ complex concrete models that required, uh, that, that required calibrations and they are too complex for everyday analysis. For example, I have one such model in mind where you have to set up 40 parameters in order to get acceptable results. So the answer to the limitations presented so far was the development of a new numerical method. This method is the compatible stress field 
method, which can be perceived as a numerical generalization and extension of the stratum type methodology. It was primarily developed by the Institute of Structural Engineering, ETH in Zurich. And the key figure behind the method is Professor Wolf Kaufman, also published a book uh, to support the method. Please note that many of the figures and tables in this presentation are taken straight from this book. In this course, we will scratch the surface of the method and only demonstrate its practical application shortly, which is the design of these continuity regions through the implementation of CSFM in the software called Idea Statica Detail. Uh, please note that, as Theodore mentioned uh, when we were beginning, that we're in the process of uh, in the process of preparing a course in collaboration with the ISTRAC-T that will explain the method in more detail uh, than today. So moving back to the CSFM, uh, since this, this method belongs to the family of stress field methods, and this is very convenient as we can use an underlying finite element engine to perform a nonlinear finite element analysis, calculate stress field, that is complemented with kinematic considerations. Simply said, the state, uh, the state of strain is accurately evaluated throughout the structure. As a result, we can take into account the effect of compression softening, which can be evaluated at, at its point, as I will demonstrate uh, in the live demonstration in idea static detail and the subsequent slide. This takes place without any of the ambiguities of the stratum time method as the ones here discussed. Uh, so to explain a little bit the method, again, this is based on a non-linear calculation that is based on a concrete model uh, which model assumes that the principal directions of stresses and strains coincide. For example, in this case, the principal direction epsilon 3 and sigma 3 coincide. However, the behavior of each of the principal directions in the cracked state is decoupled from one another, except for the compression softening effect that is taken into account and we will uh, demonstrate later. Now this set of assumptions allows us to reuse the simplified uniaxial concrete model defined in the code. So the parabola rectangle diagram that is specified in the Euro code uh, is used and the convenient thing with this is that this only depends on the compressive strength of the concrete. And this is the reason that we say that this method is design oriented because we can use uh, the diagrams from the code. Of course, uh, by default, the CSFM uses this diagram, but it's up to the user to use a more simplified one like the bilinear and in its calculation step the solver calculates the effective compressive uh, strength of the concrete which is automatically evaluated for cracked concrete based on the principal tensile strain epsilon one is the concrete is cracked this means that this value is greater than zero and in this case, we reduce the concrete strength by the use of the reduction factor Kc2. Now, depending on the value of 
tensile strain, uh, the crack concrete compressive strength is calculated using the reduction uh, relationship. That is a generalization of the FIB model code 2010. And with this relationship, we produce a softened diagram displayed by the green line. CSFM also assumes fictitious rotating stress-free cracks that open without slip and considers the equilibrium at the cracks together with the average strains of the reinforcement. As such, the model considers maximum concrete and reinforcement stresses at the locations of the cracks that are denoted by its arch here. That neglect the concrete tensile strength. The impact of this assumption is that the tensile resistance of concrete is completely neglected and makes the model compatible with the Eurocode requirements. Or, and since the method is code independent, I, we could say with any of the design code requirements. Now, even though tension is neglected to concrete, uh, method takes into account the tension stiffening effect that is considered by modifying the stress strain relationship of the bare reinforcing part. This modification it captures the average stiffness of the parts embedded in the concrete. Please note that we're using uh, the idealized model with the inclined plastic branch, which is something I will also demonstrate in the software. Uh, it's also possible to use the diagram with the horizontal branch, but, but in this case, since there is no limit strain, the codes do not limit uh, this diagram. Uh, it is not recommended to use it. Uh, so the impact of the impact of this uh, of the tension stiffening effect is that the sub the analyzed substructure stiffness is realistically captured through an average reinforcement strain, or to, see, to say it simply, the amount of reinforcement contributes to internal force redistribution, and of course, it influences deformations. So, uh, continuing with the tension stiffening effect, I have zoomed in to the displayed uh, material law. I will not go through the lengthy discussion required to describe the model. Uh, however, here I'm displaying a, a model that is of one of the most common European steels, B500B. And here we display, uh, besides the code stress strain here, there are some other curves where the effective uh, where where the effective reinforcement area is considered and where we can see that tension stiffness uh, in, tension stiffening effect indirectly affects ultimate loads either negatively or positively so uh, there are higher stiffnesses in the cases that were uh, so if a higher stiffness is due to, to tension stiffening, it can result in lower transfers, tensile strains imposed on the concrete compression. And as such, they create a less pronounced reduction in the concrete compressive strength. Of course, the FT value is always respected in any case. Uh, and 
Lastly, uh, the reduction of the ductility of reinforcement may limit the strength of members with low amounts of transverse reinforcement. Since we're running out of time, let me jump into idea statica, where I will demonstrate the use of the method. So here I will start with an example where I will create a new beam. I will go with the concrete, uh, the, 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 uh, the default concrete kind of reinforcement. I will keep the concrete covered. Create a blank project where I will model a beam. I will use a rectangular cross section. Modify the length of the beam to five meters. Make this a little bit more challenging. I will also add an opening. to the center of the beam. This is already challenging because the deflection calculation of this structure is tricky by using some other software. And the next step is to define support. So before I add my support, let me discuss a little bit uh, why we have so many options for support. And the reason is that since we create a shell element model to apply the CSFM method, uh, we're, uh, we have support with dimensions in order to avoid uh, stress concentrations. So in this case, for example, let me display a 3D view of the model we can see that the support has dimensions and it's not a point support that would lead to, uh, to stress concentrations. So I will also copy this support to the other side. I will maintain uh, the dimensions, but I will release the X direction to make it uh, a sliding support. And basically, my model uh, is ready. Before we move on, let me move to the materials and models where we can say what we discussed. Concrete, we have uh, the code parabolic, parabola, rectangle curve. Uh, it is also schematically presented the compression softened curve in case we have transfers tensile strains, where from this curve here, we calculate the KC2 value, which leads to the red curve. Of course, I also have the option to use a bilinear law, but we mainly go with uh, the default parabola rectangle one. Also for steel, we have the bilinear law with the inclined plastic branch. At this point, please note that according to the code requirements, we have a strain limit. And this strain limit is very important because it leads to, to, uh, to this red curve, which is uh, again schematically presented. And this curve is taking into account tension stiffness. Of course, I can also modify this and use uh, a law with a horizontal, uh, with a, without an inclined plastic branch. However, this material law does not have a strain limit. This is a code requirement. And since it does not have a, stra uh, a strain limit, the tension stiffening effect 
tension stiffening does not have an effect, as we can see from, from the red curve. So again, I will go to the default. Let me also change some other settings here before we move to the reinforcement. Uh, no, we will move to the load, to the loading to complete the definition of our boundary conditions. So here I will define some load cases with G. I will define, I, I, I will, uh, or G I will use for the permanent load cases. I will use Q for the variable ones. Then I will move and define the loads. I will use a line load. or uh, the self-weight I can also use a load for cover then I will also use a line load for minus 15 kilonewtons per meter for the variable load. I will then create my combinations. So I will use a year combination. So let me modify partial factors here. I will add another serviceability combination and another was permanent for the calculation of cracks. I will use a partial factor of 0 0.6. And basically, my structure is ready for calculation. Before we move on uh, and add, the, add reinforcement, it makes sense to, to have a pre-calculation for its estimation. So here, in the reinforcement definition, we have some tools. We have the linear analysis tools, which makes a pre-calculation and estimates the linear uh, and analyzes a linear elastic model. And the reason we do that is because we want to gain an understanding of the, uh, an initial understanding of the flow of forces into the member. Please note that for Euro, the Eurocode for strapping time models requires that the location and orientation of the main compression struts should be similar to that of a linear elastic finite element analysis in order to avoid major redistribution of forces in cracking. So this is a useful analysis. I also prefer to display the trajectories like this one. But besides uh, the basic linear analysis, we also have the topology optimization, which performs an optimization based on some uh, energy criteria. In essence, these tools perform an energy optimization that helps us detect the struts and the ties, the struts and ties. Uh, So let's wait a little bit. It will not take long. So the topology optimization is over, and I can have, can have this view for my reference, where I have hot parts, which are the parts, the compressed parts, and I have the blue parts, which are the ties, essentially. Now, uh, I can use this as a guide. Another use for this tool is that, for example, let's say that you want to add some openings 
So this tool can help you decide where can you position the openings. And then I will move an input to enforcement and I will, info, I will input the enforcement, which will be overlaid on this picture that can help me decide how can, can I uh, position my bars. Initially, I will add some stirrups. I will keep this diameter. Uh, I will use closed stirrups and I will use a hook. Close them. Uh, I will then have a uniform distribution of the stirrups. The software understands the opening and splits the stirrup at the region of the opening. And then I will also add a group of bars at the bottom where is the tie. I will have one layer, three bars, 12. I will define the anchorage at the beginning, at the end. The anchorage is an, a standard hook, maybe this standard bend would be better. Uh, let me also move it a little bit to the top so that it stands on top of the stirrups. This will be the bottom reinforcement. And I will copy it and also apply it at the top. Now, the thing is that uh, I have added some reinforcements. However, uh, the thing, and, and I want to make a point here, is that I do not fulfill the minimum detailing requirements. And the reason is that, for example, uh, I didn't, uh, I, I'm not having some additional bars at the side of the beam or around the opening. But let's move on and analyze the structure. Now that I have defined everything, I just need to press the calculate button. The software creates an underlying finite element shell model, performs the nonlinear calculation. The model takes into account the bars I have defined, and it will just show me the results in a graphical way. So here I can graphically see that the concrete is OK. The reinforcement fails, so I probably need more reinforcement. And the stress limitation and crack widths are OK. Uh, I can see the results in detail, but I'm not going to do that. I will just move straight away to the cracks where we can see that cracks are calculated. The value of the crack is 0 0.25 approximately, which is below uh, the limit of 0 0.30. So everything appears to be OK. The question is, is it OK? Uh, here, the crack width, uh, the software warns us that the crack is calculated in the vicinity of the reinforcement. So in the unreinforced areas, there is no check of cracking. One such area is the region around the opening. So one of the lessons that we learned here is that we can analyze any structure, but we need to, to uh, respect the detailing requirements of the code. Another thing that is very interesting is the deflection. So let me display the deformed shape where we can say, show the deflection by total load, long-term load, and of course, the total deflection, in, uh, including the effect of, of grip is displayed here where we have a deflection of minus 9.1 millimeters. So since we're running out of time, let me move back to the reinforcement and quickly, I will add one more layer of bars at the bottom. 
the distance of 25 mils. And I will quickly add reinforcement around the opening. I will use uh, one layer everywhere. Straight bars, and I'm just going to move back to the check. Perform an additional calculation. See what is going on. So, firstly, I have added, I have increased the amount of reinforcement that is failing. Second, I have added reinforcement around the opening. Uh, the software returns to the previous view where we can see uh, the overall displacement. One thing here is not that the displacement dropped from 9 mils to minus 4.5, which means that I have reduced the displacement by 50% just by adding reinforcement. This is very important. And again, let's move to the cracks where we can see that due to this reinforcement, cracks were reduced. And I can also, this time, I can also display the cracks in the, in the region of the opening, where again, I have, uh, I have low cracks. So this time, I'm sure that I'm checking the crack around the opening. So basically, uh, closing this part of the presentation in this example, I'm just I will just present some key takeaways for you. So the CSFM, in spite of its assumption simplicity, uh, it has been demonstrated that uh, that it yields accurate predictions for reinforcement of corporate members subjected to in-plane loading. This is done through various verifications that we will go, uh, that we will present in the full course that we will have in the future for the uh, presentation of the method. The CSFM is valid for members that respect the minimum reinforcement code requirements. This is also a requirement for the strategy type method. Uh, it allows the definition and analysis of any geometry, as we have demonstrated. In this case, we had a beam with an opening, and we, we could calculate, we can accurately calculate flexions, stresses, strains. And one last thing is that the method is not suited for slender members without adequate transfers reinforcement. However, in Idea Statica, we also have a solution for this last point, where we, you can use our Idea Statica member with the GMNIA analysis for concrete members. This, I think we, we can go to our uh, break and return in about half an hour for discontinuity regions in steel. Okay, thank you, Kostis. Uh, we have just a couple of questions, but I think we can just keep them for the end. So let's let's do the break now, and uh, let's all come back at uh, 1.30. Uh, you can keep the window open. The session will remain open. You simply need to just come back at uh, 1.30. So see you soon. Hello, Theo. <clears throat> okay, um, I hope everybody is back. Um, Kostis, I think, um, I mean, we have a couple of questions. I don't know if you want to quickly go through them or should we just keep them for the, for the last part? I would say to keep them for the last part, because okay. again, we have a lot of material to cover, and uh, All right. yeah, but uh, yeah. we will have 15 minutes for sure. We'll have okay, 15 minutes for sure. All right. 
Okay, so let's let's start. Uh, let's continue with the second part, which which uh, has to do with uh, divisions in steel. So, uh, please, please confirm that you can still see my screen. Yes. Yes. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. So uh, I hope everyone is back from the break. So moving to the second part of our course, we will this time we will talk about discontinuity regions in steel structures. However, at this point, I would like to emphasize that traditionally the term discontinuity regions is used for concrete structures and specifically the parts we have discussed before the break, uh, the, the regions that need to be analyzed with the stratum time method or the CSFM. However, uh, we also have such locations in steel that share the same properties with concrete structures. Uh, just as a reminder, and just to lay the ground for uh, the narration, uh, I would like to quickly remind you what's going on. So basically, the issue is that our analysis tools assume that the Bernoulli assumption is valid. Our code formulas assume the same. Fortunately, we also have uh, regions where these assumptions do not apply also in steel structures. So let's try to identify some typical discontinuity regions. Uh, one of the locations where the conditions previously mentioned do not apply are the connections between steel members. Since steel structures are located and then transferred on site where they are assembled. Uh, they need to have their, end, their ends prepared to be bolted and sometimes uh, welded on site. However, this introduces several geometry changes. Examples are uh, the bolt hole openings. Uh, Welds or the openings for weight reduction. At the member level, the main source of discontinuities are beams with openings in the web that allow the incorporation of services into the height of the ceiling. Uh, the opening shapes can vary depending on the fabrication process and they can be polygonal circular, elliptical, rectangular. They can also be stiffened. In this case, where the rectangular opening employs horizontal stiffness above and below the opening. You can also have unstiffened openings, like circular ones. And of course, there are other uh, sources of discontinuity. So for example, uh, this geometry variation, like the, the one in this picture, in uh, uh, tapered beams with or without openings. Now, the sources of disruption are clearly identified in engineering practice, and they're also identified at the guidance level where some additional design considerations are prescribed. This section, I will go shortly through the available guidance for some of the identified discontinuity regions in steel. For the case of the connections, the Eurocode con contains a special part. This is Eurocode 1993-18, where the design of joints is discussed. Uh, the main process for the joint calculation is to split the joints into the basic components and then uh, determine the resistance 
on the basis of this component. And this is more or less the approach followed by all modern codes in principle. Design methodology is known as the component method. So the code identifies several such components. I shortly display a table taken from the code. Also provides guidance for combining them back in order to determine either the final resistance of the joint or the stiffness, which is another major topic. The list of components is huge, and for its components, there are specific formulas that apply to specific cases. For example, I have taken the case of block tearing. Block tearing is a mode of failure that takes place the notched part of a bolted member, and this region is clearly a discontinued region as the stress flow is disturbed from the geometry change and the group of bolt holes where force passes usually through bearing. This is, of course, the reason that the code requires the application of special formulas to deal with this type of connection. More, we have more or less similar rules prescribed for each specific component. However, modern engineering demands can quickly reach the limits of this methodology. One such example is the case of the bird big joint. This type of hollow section connection is clearly outside the scope of Eurocode, where uh, every hollow section joint is displayed in a table. And really, in this table, we do not have uh, a supporting post of this type of joint. Despite the fact that this is not supported in the Eurocode, it is used in practice, as can be seen from the picture in this slide. Of course, there are experienced designers that have access to experimental data and formulas from related research. However, this is not accessible by anyone. To make things worse, there is also the case of bird big joints with an incoming I member. And for this case, there is absolutely no guidance and no experimental data available, at least until very recently. For this case, it is impossible to safely determine the strength of this configuration using hand calculations, even for the most experienced engineers. Another important issue that is related to the design of these regions is the assumed internal force distribution. This is something that I will discuss in the example that I prepared. It is clearly stated in the code that the chosen internal force distribution should respect the relative stiffness of the components in a joint. Again, this is something easy to say, but hard to satisfy in several cases, as I will demonstrate. As an example, what is the stress distribution in the region of a member web with an opening? Like the connections, and despite the convenience provided by webs with openings, the additional design considerations required are unfortunately do not covered in the code text. For the sake of completeness, however, I must add that the draft amendment for the annex N of the pre-standard ENV is planned. 
but this amendment was never added to the final code text. This is that the SCI published an excellent guide to fill this gap. This guide is displayed here and is named the design of composite beams with large web openings. This guide also bears the code name P355. Again, this is a strongly recommended read for everyone uh, designing these structures. Just to scratch the surface of this member, of, 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 of the design of such members, uh, in the region of the openings, the beams are governed by the effect that is called the Vierendil bending, or known as four corner bird bending, which is the result of the presence of openings at the region uh, of the beam. Since a big part of the beam web is removed, uh, is, is locally reduced, this means that uh, at this location, the beam loses its ability to resist shear forces. And this is the reason that the guide uh, recommends to position these openings away from high shear zones like the beam end. The design uh, of these beams in the context of this guide are valid for rectangular, circular, and elongated circular opening. openings. If you have another type of opening, then uh, you're out of luck. Uh, also, it is essential to have a uniform web thickness. Although the problem is well defined and the SCI uh, worked a lot to extend the previous guidance, it's clear that a lot of things are not covered. For example, it is very hard to calculate the correct deflections for a beam with openings uh, because it's not easy to capture the deflection ampli amplification due to the existence of these openings. Of course, the designers need to identify specific cases and apply some specific design rules, which may be significantly different in case of geometrical changes between design durations. Uh, the influence of the openings need to be carefully considered, especially at the regions of high shears, called the end posts. And of course, it is also very important to identify the potential interaction of openings near the location of the connections. This is the reason it is always recommended to maintain a minimum distance between first and the last opening and the corresponding connection to prevent unintended deviations from the design. Uh, lastly, in case that you create an opening in an existing structure, there is always the danger that the opening may lie outside the limits of the guidance due to potential failure during the construction. Uh, so, in order to work around the limitations of the current methodologies, a new method was developed called the component-based finite element method. Again, we will not dive into the details, but we will just present the bare minimum you need to know to understand what is going on. And in line with the uh, CSFM method presented before the break, CBFM is a finite element generalization of the component method. Uh, it is a generalization of the component method because originally 
it was created to generalize the design of steel connections. However, due to its nature, it will be proved that it can be also used for the successful design of members. Uh, the authors of the method maintain a dedicated website that you can see in the slide, which offers information and educational material for anyone interested for a deeper understanding of the method. Support the method. Uh, a dedicated book was also published. And there, the components of the method are presented. And of course, uh, the validations and verifications uh, are presented in detail. The main author is Professor Frantic Paul, who is the head of the Department of Steel and Timber Structures at the Technical University of Prague. Professor Val participated in many European projects and is also involved in the committee that is responsible for preparing the Eurocode part uh, that is uh, the Eurocode part for connection designs. One very important thing we need to highlight is that the method is not an arbitrary application of finite elements. Again, this is in line with the CSFM that we presented previously. This is a design-oriented method, which means that it provides very good agreement with the results of reference calculations uh, in the context of the codes. To ensure that this is true, the method is methodologically verified and validated uh, and uh, it is proved that it can predict the behavior of any of the assessed structural parts. This is a very important step. It is usually skipped from an experienced analyst. And of course, this is the reason that in the industry, we see that a lot of experienced engineers do not blindly trust the results of any finite element analysis. Um, uh, last but not least, we must say that the CBFM components are fine-tuned finite element sub-modules that reflect the behavior of the plates, bolts, welds, etc., as described in the code. These finite element sub-modules are also called CBFM components and they have very good agreement with the ones contained in the Euro. Uh, so the CBFM calculation is based on a sophisticated shell element model that is automatically created from a description of a substructure, either a connection or a member. The CBFM model contains every aspect of the substructure including connection plates, uh, bolt elements, constraints for the welds, etc. Now, in this model, we can apply a range of analysis that can be performed according to the provisions of Eurocode 199315, uh, ANEX C. The application of these provisions is the thing that makes CBFM code compliant. So according to this part, in order to perform any analysis, we need to apply an elastoplastic material with a nominal plateau slope, which is displayed in this picture. Again, according to the code, for the ultimate limit state, and for structures that are not susceptible to buckling. This is something that we need to emphasize and I will need to return later on this condition. We just need to ensure that the principal plastic strain is limited below 5%. This is a really convenient uh, condition because 
when this is fulfilled, it means that the structure fulfills the requirements of uh, the ultimate limit uh, state. It doesn't matter if the part is connection, it is a member, it doesn't matter its geometry and its location. This means that the ultimate limit state verification is identical for everything that can be modeled. Now, since the analyzed substructures are essentially shell element models, the code points to the relevant provisions of another part of the code, which is 1993.6, where several options are provided for the analysis of these cell substructures. From this range of analysis, the simplest and fastest to apply is the one called the MNA analysis. This is based on the shell bending theory applied to the perfect structure with the assumption of small deflection. This means that this structure does not account for imperfections. In the context of the CBFM, we also support the most advanced analysis available, which is the GMNIA. Again, this is based based on the shell bending theory. However, this analysis uh, employs geometrically and material is geometrically and materially nonlinear. It is applied to the imperfect structure, which includes the unintended deviations from the perfect shape. And of course, uh, since this is geometrically nonlinear, it is using the assumptions of Nonlinear large deflection theory. Uh, this is one of the most advanced types of analysis that is out there, and it is very useful, especially for hollow sections and the accurate assessment of member substructures. However, according to the same code, every numerical analysis proposed therein should include a bifurcations, Higgin value check or its load level. It's actually the way to check if the substructure is susceptible to any type of buckling as requested for the verification of the ultimate limit state. And this is the reason that I emphasized this requirement uh, previously. This is a very, very important analysis. As such, this type of analysis is covered in this part of the code, and it is shortly called the LBA analysis. This is a linear eigenvalue analysis where the linearity results from the assumptions of a linear elastic material using the small deflection theory. Uh, however, this analysis helps us obtain a number of Egan values, and it gives us the lowest Egan value at which the shell may buckle, but into a different deformation mode than the one predicted from the static analysis. Like the strain limit, this is a generalized way of checking susceptibility to buckling. The results of this analysis are load amplifiers under which the applied loads lead to the formation according to the calculated buckling shapes. Usually the buckling shape that corresponds to uh, the lowest critical factor is checked, but this is not necessarily the only critical one. In general, for slender substructures, any critical factors under the limit of 15 should be assessed, fixed, according again to the provisions of the group. This analysis is also very important because these critical buckling shapes can serve as imperfections for the GMNIA analysis. 
force to be used as imperfections. They must be properly amplified, again, according to rules that are outside the scope of the scores. At this point, I will close this short presentation, CBFM, and move to an actual model. Uh, and calculate this model. I need to create a project. In this case, I will create a very, very simple connection just to demonstrate the principles of the CBFM method. So I will add a new member. I will create this member from a built up section, which will provide. 130 mils, which will be 400 mils. It will employ very thick plates, and I will also choose the proper uh, steel grade as requested by uh, the UK ANX. I will also copy it and update this member. So we have positioned five built up members in place. Now we just connect them using manufacturing operations. Just press OK. So the connection is already in place. I just need to modify it slightly, so I will increase the thickness of the end plates. This is a symmetrical connection. Now I need to move my bolts in place. Then I will also position the bolt columns. Lastly, I need to modify my welds. So for the flanges, I will have a single fillet weld. Same for the webs. Basically, the only thing I have done so far, uh, I didn't define any finite element properties or something. The only thing I have done is I have created the model of the connection. Now, let's add some loading. I will add a load that only uh, contains shear forces. You can check that there is balance in this joint. And besides, this load effect. I will also add another one. So my connection is ready to be solved. I'm just pressing the calculated button. And here, uh, right now, we're using Idea Static Connection, which is the first software that employs the CBFM method. And when I pressed the calculate button, uh, using CBFM, the software created a cell element description from this connection that uh, includes everything. The plate, it includes the bolts, etc. This model is already solved. Now I can graphically see the result of the state of strain. Remember from the slides that strain is the only condition we need to check in order to fulfill the ultimate limit states check. I can also display it. I can activate the mess and have a better overview of the results of this check. So I can graphically see, let me pick, for example, this end plate. So here, 
I can graph it to see that uh, some part of this plate is gray. The gray parts remain in the elastic area. I see the green parts that are plastified, but, but although they're plastified, they satisfy, they fulfill uh, the limitation of the plastic strain, which is below 5%. And of course, it's possible to have some orange parts that, have, uh, uh, that signify uh, high utilization, but nevertheless, it do not fail. And of course, we have red colors denoting fail. Besides that, I need to, at this point, I need to take another step to ensure that the structure is not susceptible to buckling. Remember that we need it, that we need to ensure that this is not susceptible to buckling in order to fulfill uh, the ultimate limit state check. So let's perform the buckling stack, the buckling check. Again, the calculation is performed for both load cases. And I can see here that the lowest factor the lowest amplifier is 42, clearly over 15. So this means that what I see here, that I have a passing structure, is, uh, is OK. Before we move on, let me also demonstrate uh, another feature of the calculation. And let's uh, initially look at, firstly, let me display the results for, uh, for uh, the first load case, the case of moment. And let me activate both forces where we can clearly see that we, can ha we have a bolt force distribution that is linear. Uh, if, we, uh, if we were trying to perform a hand calculation, we would probably assume this linear uh, force distribution that in this case is adequate. Let's move to the excel force case where again uh, in this case we would assume a uniform bolt force distribution. However in this case CBFM is slightly uh, different from this assumption and we can see that the top bolt, for example, is higher than the rest. And the reason that it does so is will be uh, obvious if I activate the deformed shape. Let me also increase the scale of deformation. Now, in this case, we can see that due to the deformation, again, this is something unique to the CBFM and makes the results more intuitive. We can see here that due to this deformation, the top bolt elongates more. More elongation means higher force. Uh, if you remember that when I started the presentation, uh, one of the requirements of the Eurocode 1993 was that uh, the internal force distribution should, uh, must respect the relative stiffnesses and this is what the cbfm naturally does due to the underlying finite element analysis so uh, again in this case in our hard calculation if we would assume this uh, uniform distribution we would not be far from 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 uh, the true behavior also let me click on the weld where we can see the weld distribution. Again, uh, if we would hand calculate this, we would assume a uniform distribution. However, uh, again, we have stress peaks at the locations near the flanges. 
Uh, now, why is this important? Now, let me move back to the slides where I will present a case, uh, an actual case from uh, from an actual project uh, that was uh, uh, from the Arabs at London 10th Furniture Avenue. Now, in this case, plate to plate connection. This is the connection I have just modeled in Idea Statica. Uh, was uh, during the erection process, they had to put this plate to plate connection between beam openings. The problem is that uh, using the classical hand calculation in the component method could not account for the local effects of the web openings in the beam. The reason is that they had to, to, to make an assumption, for example, for the bolt force calculation or the weld, uh, or the weld stress distribution etc. So let's move back in the context of discontinuity regions. I will just uh, add these openings here. So I will create an identical copy of this section. And then I will add the openings. Add an opening with 350 mils diameter and move it next to the end plate. And then I will also copy it and move it to the other web. So there it is. Press the calculate button, and this is it. Again, CBFM will take care of this discontinuity. At this point, you can see that I, ha I already have some, uh, I have different colors from previous attempt. Let's have a look at the strain check, where we can see that there are some differences at the region of the opening. At this point, let me deactivate the deformed shape and also display the equivalent stresses, which are the von Mises stresses. It is clear that the discontinuity is accounted and we can see the disturbance in the stress field. But we can see that uh, high stresses coincide with the regions where we have uh, plastic plastification at the top and the bottom of the beam. What is more important, however, is let's have a look at the bolt force distribution. Let's look at the case of the moment. Here we can see that we have both forces, but these forces do not follow a linear pattern. We have something like an asymptotic curve. Let's also look at the case of the axial force. Again, here we can see that the two, the two bolts that are near the opening are gray, which means that the, their forces are reduced. They remain in the elastic region. However, the force was redistributed towards the flanges, where we can see that the two top, the, the, the two outer bolt rows uh, have higher bolt force values. Let's also have a look at the, stray, at the well stress distribution, where again we can see that at the region, at the location of the opening, we have a huge drop to the stress distribution and of course we have a redistribution towards the flanges. 
Uh, in any case, the connection passes the checks and we just need to, to perform a buckling check to ensure that the checks are passed. Again, we have uh, probably have, yes, for some reason. Okay, so there it is. Uh, so now we can see that the lowest amplifier for buckling is, has, has a value of 29 compared to the previous attempt, uh, which was 42, it dropped, but then again, it's over 15, so I can accept the calculation of this configuration. So let's move back to the slides. And at this point, as we move, as we're running out of time, I will go through also the case of beams because of the method we have just applied for connection verification is also applicable for the check of members. And in the context of this course, members with discontinuity regions. In the previous week, we had a webinar that was recorded and is already uploaded. I will uh, copy the link into the chat for everyone interested. So uh, we had a webinar that was discussing the design of these members and how to overcome limitations. In this webinar, we demonstrate the results of the CBFM against a worked example in BSCI and demonstrated that we had identical results. Uh, so uh, at this point, let me jump to idea statica member, which is a CBFM path for members, and open the model that corresponds to a worked example from the SCI. I will not model it from scratch. So here we have a model that has the openings. We have a beam with the openings, the welds, uh, we also have connections accurately modeled and also uh, the supporting columns partially modeled. We could also have, uh, in case we had perlins, for example, we could also have part of these perlins models along with their connections. And this is very important because we are including all constraints and we're accounting them during the analysis. And this leads to very accurate results. Again, in this case, in display strain check, like we did in the CBFM, where I can see graphically the results of this analysis. So everything is gray, meaning that it means in the elastic region. We also have performed the linear buckling analysis. We're slightly over 15, but this is okay. This is in line with the requirements of the code. So again, we have the same thing. We have a structure, calculated it, and the results are presented in an intuitive way. Uh, now, in the corresponding SCI guide, there is a list of geometric limitations that apply on the geometry of openings, positions, uh, and the guide explicitly mentions that these limits may be used, openings outside these limits may be used, but 
the recalculation needs to be justified and in line with the principles presented in this guide. It's a generic nature, CBFM can be used for the calculation of any opening outside the limits of the sky. Another important limitation is that point loads should always be applied at the distance of the opening edge. Of course, this makes perfect sense as concentrated loads create local effects. At the top of what uh, this guidance calls the equivalent T. This local effect disturbs the flow of axial stresses that are displayed in this picture. And of course, uh, although we do not consider good practice the application of local loads in these positions, this is something that would happen during fabrication or erection, uh, etc. In this case, we need a way to check this. So again, I will just go and open a model. Local load is, uh, is included. So the local load is located directly on top of the opening. One thing that I would like to highlight is the fact that point loads are not actually point loads, but in line with what we have presented in the CSFM, since we have an underlying cell element model, we need to have uh, a way of reducing stress peaks, stress concentrations. So what we do is that uh, we apply this load in an area uh, because in reality, no, uh, concentrated loads are just not there. The loads are applied on an area. And this is something that we maintain uh, in this approach. In this case, the results are very intuitively presented. So we can see here that we have some reds. Reds denote failure. Of course, we can see that the local, the local effect of the load, the beam opening, since there is failure and there is big failure, we do not even have to uh, go through the corresponding LBA analysis. Another major issue with these beams is the ambiguity, calculation of deflections and internal forces. Uh, it's an issue especially because uh, we're using beam elements in global analysis software, and these and beam elements cannot account for the amplification of, of the deflections due to the presence of openings. Uh, the, uh, the SCI guide contains some formulas for the case of a uniformly distributed load and of a central point load. However, in modern engineering, we require to have arbitrary loads, either distributed or concentrated, and these loads are also combined in arbitrary ways. From this perspective, the numerical nature of CBFM works very well in both calculation of deflections and internal forces. Another, sorry, lastly, another important limitation is the lack of definitive guidance for the design of openings at the location of the end post. And of course, the interaction with, uh, potential interaction with the neighboring uh, connections. However, in the context of CBFM, I will load another model where I have applied openings directly at the connection. Again, this is something that we can easily, we can calculate. So moving to the check, 
I display the strain check. In this case, I have some green color. So I have uh, some plastification of the corners, the openings. However, everything else is green. And I also have performed the linear buckling analysis, which is over 15. So uh, this was my last slide. And I would also like to, uh, what I would like to take away from CBFM is that this is a generalized method that can calculate almost any discontinuity region, steel structures, mainly because it can account for the, cornet, for, for the correct internal force distribution. This, has, uh, this method has very good agreement with reference calculations as it is design oriented and strives for compliance. And it is, uh, we can prove that CBFM can be safely used to calculate cases that are not directly covered in the code or are impossible to be calculated in the context of the current guidance. The two methods we have presented share some similarities. They both employ a nonlinear finite element analysis using the stress strain loss provided. They present the checks graphically, and the checks are intuitive and insightful. Uh, they provide a clear understanding, stress flow and internal force distribution. Lastly, both methods allow full control over the design process. This slide, we can move to the Q&A session. So. OK, uh, thank you, Kostis. Uh, we have a, a few minutes. Uh, there are plenty of questions. I think we will not be able to answer all of them, but let me just quickly start uh, with the first one. Uh, could you please explain more what was mentioned in the code about linear analysis and how should it lead the strat and tie assignment? A look. So the linear analysis, about the linear analysis, this is something, uh, I, this is something that is mentioned in the code, but uh, I do not have this in hand right now. I'm sure, if it's in one of my slides, so let me back. Give me a minute. Well, I do not have it in here. I will. Uh, I will. Uh, I will Maybe answer with an email. It. Yes, I will answer with an email. Yes, and uh, I will send the code reference. Okay. Uh, there is another question again about the strat and tie. Uh, speaking of the strat and tie method disadvantage, specifically strat and tie different models. Is it possible to use the available models that might be predicted as a guide? To end up with the most accept, acceptable mode of failure, if we may say, or is there any other guideline aspects uh, or aspects to choose the model that we would be considered uh, in the design? It's a long question. I'm not sure if you want me to read it again. Uh, actually, I'm looking at it. Mm -hmm. Well, the thing is that uh, basically uh, we're discussing about the CSFM method. CSFM is a generalization of the strategy type, meaning that, as I demonstrated, part of the workflow is the topology optimization. The topology optimization gives you a tool that calculates, let's say, strat and time model 
that is uh, based on uh, energy optimization, which means that it's not ambiguous. Uh, on the other hand, if you want uh, if you want to use a particular stratum time model in the context of CSFM, meaning that you want to derive some reinforcements and check them, this is something that you could do, that you can always do. Uh, I, in, in my demonstration, I was freely adding bars everywhere I wanted to do. And there was also uh, an inclined tie that I didn't follow. So I didn't add a bar, an inclined bar. All my bars were either horizontal or vertical. So basically, you are not, uh, let's say, uh, you're not bounded by any strat and tie uh, configuration. You can basically model whatever you want and just check it. Okay, um, let's move to the next one. And this is about steel. Uh, can you please give explicit reference on the buckling load factor limit to be further checked when lower than 15 in the Euro code? Oh, well, yes. What, what is the recommended uh, further checking approach? Okay, I have one deactivated slide because I wanted to reduce the material. And in this case, uh, the value of 15 is directly referred to the first part of the Eurocode 1993-11 for plastic analysis. However, uh, in the case, in the specific case of connection design, there is more than this. This is only the surface. And you could always look additional information in our website at ideastatica.com about buckling. Okay. Um, the next one is actually the same. Can you please clarify again why it is, is it okay since it is greater than 15? I guess this is answered as well. Um, is it possible to force the software to follow a specific strat and tie configuration? Uh, again, by uh, the, the strat and tie is an interpretation of, uh, a, 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 let's say that it is an interpretation of the behavior of my concrete part of my sub model. This interpretation leads to designing uh, sp specific, uh, leads to, to adding re reinforcement to specific positions called the ties. Uh, you can always, let's say that you have, uh, that you want to check reinforcement that was derived from a specific strat and tie configuration. There is no, nothing stopping you from uh, using this configuration in idea statica detail and checking it with the CSFM. I guess to, to put it in different in different words, the, the, the topology optimization is just a recommendation. It's not exactly. something that you that you need to follow. It's just a recommendation where you need to add the reinforcement, but you can always add the reinforcement in, in any position in your model. Um, and let's move to the last one because we are just run out of time. Uh, when calculating deflection of concrete with discontinuity, can you enter temperature and time of loading information or enter a creep factor which accounts for this information that you have calculated? Uh, well, so temperature and time of loading. Temperature and time of loading. Uh, I think that uh, uh, for the moment you can input the grip factor, but the rest are some improvements that we plan to do to the software. And they, they are future improvements. So for the moment, you can just enter the grip factor. 
Okay, uh, I think we can we came to an end. Uh, it's two thirty already. Um, so with this, uh, I would like to thank all of you for joining. Uh, it's been really great to have you in this last course before the summer break. Um, we will uh, answer any questions that uh, we haven't answered through uh, live. Through, we will answer them via email. Um, so please um, uh, watch this space because we're going to upload all the new uh, courses from September. So the, you are you will be able to register for this event as well. And uh, I want to wish you all um, a nice summer and we hope to see you uh, back in September. Thanks a lot, bye-bye. Thank you for attending, bye.